we are ready to rock and roll. Grill Adventures, Demir Rogues. It's a tale as old as time at this point in standard, isn't it, Marty? It's like we've seen this several times over now. Yeah, this is really just two of, I guess, what is establishing itself as the three pillars of the format, the rock, paper, scissors of Gruul, Esper, and Demir Rogues. Um, and yeah, this matchup, in theory at least, should be favored for Nassif. Adventures typically has a good matchup against Rogues, but as we've seen, it can go either way. It's just a matter of the draws and what specific build players are bringing to try to prepare for the various matchups. I was about to say, Gab kept a hand without green, but luckily there's the pathway to ensure that we can get one of our green threats down at a later stage. Edgewell Innkeeper, as we know, typically doesn't come down on turn one. We like to see it rocked out on turn four with one of our adventure creatures. Uh, taking a look at Brian's hand. Again, pretty good start. You know, the ideal curve of, you know, one turn one, Thieves Guild Enforcer, turn two, Soaring Thought Thief, turn three, hopefully keep up a counterspell or something which he doesn't have in hand right now but does have that into the story so it's going to be looking to get to seven cards in the graveyard as quick as possible yeah and that's the reason the gap has kept the hand he did which didn't have green mana it was because when rogues is trying to go turn one thieves guild enforcer turn two soaring thought thief you want to have the bone crusher giant into the fire prophecy you want to be ready to answer every part of this ideal curve from rogues so mm -hmm. they can't snowball the game away from you and this hand has access to all of that for gab so he was willing to take a bit of a riskier keep to have all those answers yeah, as you mentioned, the Bone Crusher Giant stomps in a hand for the Thieves Guild and Force of the Fire Prophecy for the Soaring Thought Thief. And then once those creatures or once those threats are dealt with, then we can start looking at developing the Gruul board. Also found a Scavenging Ooze off the top, which is going to be super helpful at keeping that graveyard in check once the threats are dealt with. Yeah, for Gab, the Scavenging Goose is going to do double duty because it's going to both keep Gab's graveyard under control. So uh, Brian's graveyard matters for the opponent cards don't really get out of hand, but also keep Brian's graveyard under control because we see that Luris companion uh, in Brian's uh, companion zone as the build of choice that he's brought. And some of the things that come with that are no Zara Sands and no Nighthawk, Nighthawk Enforce. Uh, Nighthawk Scavengers, which mm -hmm. are two of the cards that we've seen recent builds of rogues running to try to answer the Skrull matchup that Brian doesn't have access to. Well, Mage's domination off the top here for Brian, who's at seven cards in the graveyard already, so into the story is online. Uh, yeah, nothing else story. to do this turn, just uh, grabbing Luris from the companion zone. Into the story is online, and... I think the fact that uh, Gab actually put away the scavenging ooze is really curious to me, considering we were just talking about it. it is such a good card in this matchup, uh, but Gab actually prioritizes the rest of his hand, so he disagrees. All right, well, we have come to know, or come to learn that Gab Nassif never does anything accidentally, so... As a plan behind sending away that scavenging ooze. Curious to see what he's going to do here. It's going to start things off, though, with Stomp, it looks like, and just uh, deal with this Thieves Guild Enforcer. Yeah, get the rogue off the board. Likely develop the Edgewall Innkeeper at this point. If your opponent cast something like Lull Mage's Domination next turn, it, it's not actually the worst for you, as it is stalling them from playing into the story for a turn. Uh, what you really don't want to do as Gruul is allow your opponent to kind of have the windows to resolve this into the story at no cost to them. Uh, mm -hmm. But for Gab, I guess just choosing to hold it and being able to play both next turn anyways means that he's not really disrupting his curve, though maybe leaving himself with potentially less options as if he had drawn another one or maybe a harsh desire. So land go from BBD, sends it back to Gavin Nassif. Going to set himself up nicely for an into the story on the end step. Edgewell Innkeeper on the stack. Going to be followed up here by the Bone Crusher Giant. Yeah, this is a pretty terrifying uh, position 
from BBD side of things because resolving into the story while still at 20 life for rogues is more or less the dream as far <laughs> as things go. So now he's going to be able to untap with a full hand of cards and really able to do whatever he wants with them without the fear of pressure that rogues would typically be feeling at this point in the game. Yeah. Yeah, at this point in the game, you'd expect you'd expect your opponent to be almost dead as the gruel player, but uh, that's not the case here. As you know, Gab Nassif is just prioritizing keeping all these threats in check and making sure that this mill game plan doesn't you know get out of hand. But uh, speaking of out of hand, there is plenty that Brian Braun doing can do this turn. Yeah, it's really unfortunate because the Edgewall Innkeeper plan isn't really the route to victory for Gruul against Rogues, just because you're not going to be able to keep up with the Rogues card advantage. That's just not really something that Gruul is able to do. Uh, if, if you were able to resolve a Great Henge, that, that would be a different story because now every creature that you draw will enable that. But as it stands, because uh, all Gab has is these two creatures, uh, from BBD's side, he doesn't actually care about the Edgewall Innkeeper. He's got all the cards in the world. He's got the ability to just take these threats. So he's not actually worried about what... Uh, what Gab is able to do in terms of draw cards off that innkeeper, he's much more worried about what he can do in terms of pressuring his life total. Hmm. So we see the Lull Mage's domination there after the Thieves Guild Enforcer, just making sure there's eight cards in the graveyard. Stealing that Bone Crusher Giant's going to go and hang out on BBD's side of things now. The draw there for Gab Nassif was the Lovestruck Beast, so still be able to get some cards off of our Edgewall Innkeeper. Once we yeah, get the Hearts Desire good, on the battlefield. That's a pretty good draw as well, because uh, Gab, with his remaining single mana, could actually choose to Primal Might down the Bone Crusher Giant and take back control of the board. Uh, we see a bit of hesitation there, as he may be considering casting something like the Crowan War instead. Uh, just really taking the time to consider his options, as if there's one thing we know about Gab Nassif, it's that he is a deliberate player. <laughs> Deliberate indeed, goes for the Lovestruck Beast, draws a card, finds a forest off the top of the library, and passes the turn back. Ooh, it eliminates. That's a nice draw. So, another copy of Lull Mage's Domination can steal the, uh, the Lovestruck Beast. There's also lures that can start replaying the threats from the graveyard. These are eliminate. Like, what do you see as the the most efficient use of mana here for Brian? Hey, this is the reason Brian feels so good is he has all of these options, right? I think stealing the Lovestruck Beast is probably the most tempting. Just keep Brian, uh, keep Gab's side of the board in check. Keep the size small and with that eliminate in hand as well he's not really worried about anything else happening uh so what he can do here is take the lost piece for three and with that merfolk wind robber he can actually <laughs> enable it as an attacker as well so brian continues to uh assert dominance here by being the beatdown and using gab's own creatures against him <laughs> so next turn the love Struck beast will be active and able to start swinging in here. And speaking of swinging in, the Bone Crusher Giant and the Thieves Guild Enforcer are going to get in here for seven points of damage with a follow up eliminate to deal with whatever threat Gab Nassif, or whatever threat that BBD thinks needs dealing with. Yeah, BBD does have a decision point here. Do I want to kill this innkeeper before there is a potential other adventure creature? But I think he also has to ask himself, if there is an adventure creature with my current hand, do I care if Nasif draws a card? Or would I rather just kill the adventure creature? And he ends up deciding to hold on to the Eliminate, which I think is the better choice. Now, if Gabe was to play something like the Akroan War, for example, to try mm -hmm. to steal back this Lovestruck Beast as a blocker for these larger creatures, Brian has the removal spell to prevent that from being a valid line. Yeah, also has it for in case of a primal might. So if one of the creatures decides to fight one of these other creatures, then the eliminate can deal with that. So good to uh, hold on to it here for Brian Brandon. 
Yeah, just a little bit of bonus. Brian does know, based on open le- deck lists, that Gab does have one copy of Primal Might and two copies of the Akron War. So potentially playing around some of the lesser played cards in the list just because he does have the luxury to do so in his current position. Mm. So an unfortunate pickup uh, in the creature that was drawn from Gab Nassif, Edge or Innkeeper. Not super useful when there's nothing else in the battlefield, but here we're going to see the Akron War come down and steal back one of these bigger creatures. We've seen, we've seen several creatures change hands this weekend at the hands of a Crow and War. Yeah, it's a card that's continuing to pick up in popularity, though I have seen on Twitter that some players are starting to question whether it's uh, performing as intended or whether it's underperforming for them. I believe one of the players that I saw mentioning it was LSV, uh, Mm -hmm. talking about whether uh, he would prefer something else in that spot. But yeah, it's still a point of contention for players whether the Corona War is the uh, answer of choice in the Gruel Mirror. Well, I think, like you mentioned earlier, after this weekend, there'll be a bunch of statistics and performance notes and stuff that people can go and have a look at and see. Did this card actually pull its weight, or is it being answered too many times, like by, by cards like Wilt or Thrashing Brontodon, or you know, stealing things back in other ways? But uh, there we see the eliminate on the bone. Excuse me, on the Lustruck Beast. So keeping this battlefield as small as possible with these three one ones left behind. Yeah, and we're going to see how Brian prioritizes this Lurus of the Dream Den, whether he wants to play it to get back something like the Soaring Thought Thief that died earlier to the Fire Prophecy, or whether he's actually wanting to look for more cards. So we'll maybe see an attack followed by sacrifice of the Merfolk Wind Robber uh, to replay it and potentially cash in two more cards this turn. I think he's just going to be just wait while the Akron Wars second chapter passes before doing that? Uh, it's possible. The problem... Uh, by waiting for the Akron War second chapter is if Nasif has anything in the meantime, things are going to continue getting worse for him. Uh, okay. I think Soaring Thought Thief is great here because it adds more pressure to the board and gives you another flying attacker that doesn't really care about the Akron War. And mm-hmm. Yeah, it just allows Brian to realize that right now, even though typically Gruul is the aggressor in this matchup, at the moment, (laughs) Brian is the beatdown. Oh yes, for sure. Because now we're going to see a bunch of mill there, courtesy of the Soaring Thought Thief, as well as the Merfolk Wind Robber. Turn gets passed back. Now each creature has to attack next turn, thanks to their Crow and War. Both players are flooding out a little bit here. We do see the Primal Mites, and we do see the Shadow Skulls smashing in the hands of Gavna's Thief. So it's going to be interesting to see how he prioritizes the removal spells that he does have available to him. I would guess that Gab has to use the smashing to get li- rid of Loris and the Soaring Thought Thief here. Uh, mm-hmm. He does have the exact mana to do so, and just can't really allow Loris to remain on the battlefield. Same with Thought Thief. Thought Thief is bringing the pressure of Loris, giving him recursion card advantage, and uh, once those are out of the board, out of the way gab can take a moment to really think about how he's going to answer the rest of this board likely uh by chumping the two ground attackers and then hoping the third chapter of the akron war will do a good job of finishing them off yeah Oof, another land drawn here for brian brown doing who looked to be in a really commanding position but at this point now things aren't gonna look so hot for him after this uh akron war's third chapter goes off yeah it's going to be rough for Brian, but one thing that he does have going for him is he does top deck a lot better than Gab does here. Gab mm-hmm. does have some small creatures that he can draw or some medium sized creatures, but Brian still has three copies of Into the Story left in his deck, and drawing them at any point this late into the game would do a great job of ensuring that he's actually going to be able to uh, win this game. Zagoth Triumph looks to be scryed here. Help Brian dig a little deeper into the library. Finds a rune crab. All right. I mean, it's not the most exciting pick off the top, but, you know, I'll take it. 
Gab's going to uh, take Gab. four points of damage, down to one. Playing it a bit risky here, but realizing that he may need the card advantage from that edge wall innkeeper. Going down to one means now he can die to a stomp as well. Uh, sorry, there's no stomps in Brian's deck. He just has a bone crusher giant on the battlefield. But into the story, <laughs> that's a good card. That is a great pick up there as both creatures deal damage equal to their power to themselves. So board wipe in essence. Here comes a Lovestruck Beast. We're going to get some more cards off of the Edgewall Innkeeper, so very heads up for Gab Nassif to not put both of them in front of the attackers. And immediately gets rewarded for it. Mm -hmm. Risked it for the Biscuit, and the Biscuit paid off, as now we see four creatures on the battlefield here for Gab Nassif. He is going to be very sad to see this into the story, though. Oh, yes. It's like, you think you're fine, you think you're fine, and then, bam, into the story. Oh, look, I have so many cards now. How many of them are removal? How many of them are counter spells? Wouldn't you like to know? Ooh, right. that Soaring Thought Thief will almost assuredly end this game as now, with that Eliminate draw as well, there's no real danger of Brian dying as the biggest source of damage that can come out, the Primal Might or the... Uh, or the Amber Cleave would both be countered by essentially that single eliminate. Yeah, that was a really good draw there. I mean, Agadim's Awakening 2 just flooding the battlefield now with so many threats, way more than Gab Nassif can answer. And like you mentioned, the flying threat's going to go unanswered and uh, should wrap up the game here for Brian Brown Dune. Yeah, Brian with that uh, fabled passage as well. He is able to play the Merfolk Wind Robber from his graveyard to present another lethal attacker, uh, upping it from one to two. And then he should feel pretty secure that no matter what happens on Gabe's turn, uh, he isn't really able to lose this game. Yeah, so that into the story coming in clutch here for Brian Brown doing. Gavin Asif is going to take a look and all he can do is smile. Seeing these two lethal threats in the air needs to draw another piece of removal but that's not going to do it for him as we know that there's an eliminate but that is a shadow skull smashing does that change anything i mean that is the removal that gab needed because it's essentially two pieces of removal the big yeah. problem is that brian still has that third or second soaring thought thief in his mm -hmm. hand so since that's not an ember cleave this isn't going to present lethal uh, for Nassif, and that means that Brian isn't forced to use this Eliminate. He'll just be able to wait until the end step, flash it in the Soaring Thought Thief, mm -hmm. and end the game that way. So a glimmer of hope in the Shadow Skull smashing, but unfortunately not going to be enough for Gab Nassif as he figures his way out, or figures his way through this next turn. Primal Might for zero, first and foremost. Goes for the Eliminate, oh. nonetheless. Uh, and this is a bit of mind games from Gab, actually, as <laughs> this is now going to allow him to survive in a position that Brian could have avoided uh, if he didn't use that Eliminate. Yeah. There wasn't really a real need to, mm. uh, because it was for zero, and now Brian is giving Gab another turn. Yeah, great read there from Gab Nassif. It, it, Baiting out that spell. Nice, very well done. It's not going to matter too much, given <laughs> that <laughs> Gab's, Brian still has this board stake, he has the Blood Chief's Thirst, but it, anytime you can prevent your opponent having another turn, it mm -hmm. is typically nice to do so. Uh, and it's one of those situations where now it's... Uh, there really isn't a draw that can get Gab back into this mm -hmm. game. But Especially with so many cards going into the graveyard. It's actually just going to be a mill lethal. Oh, yeah, yes. I think okay. so. Yeah, it's just Soaring game over. We'll finish this. I guess when every rogue you play mill six, it doesn't take <laughs> much to get rid of your opponent's entire library. All right, so death in multiple manners there for Brian Brown doing Gab Nassif falling to the mill plan of the rogues. Let's go to sideboards and uh, gonna take a very, very short break as we see the players get ready for game number two here. So don't go anywhere, we'll be right back with more magic from the League Weekend.
Welcome back to the League Weekend, friends. I'm Ailey Loney alongside Mani Davudi, catching up with Gab Nassif and Brian Brown Doon as they both sideboard for game number two. Brian Brown Doon picking up the first win via Mill. So what does Gab Nassif do for this next game? Uh, for Gab, he's able to board into more of the mid-range game plan that Gruel likes to take in this matchup. One of the big things that we typically see is the larger enchantments, uh, and the larger artifacts get boarded out, while Ox of Agonis gets boarded in. This allows Ro uh, Gruel to play out of their graveyard and make use of the cards that Rogues is milling for them. It also means that they're less susceptible to the counter spells that the Rogue matchup tends to have, like Drown of the Loch. So you see the powerful artifacts getting boarded out there in favor of the uh, Phoenix of Ash, the Ox of Agonis, Clothis as well. It's just been an absolute house in the games where she's shown up on turn three. Or where she's yeah, been able to resolve, I should say. Absolutely. We also see the <laughs> extra copies of Fire Prophecy coming in out of the sideboard. We saw how important it was for Gab to stop Brian from snowballing the game by removing that first uh, Soaring Thought Thief, but mm -hmm. ultimately it wasn't Oof. enough. Well, would you call that a keeper? Heck no. <laughs> <laughs> this looks Not much better. Quite, unfortunately. <laughs> this hand is nice. Yeah, this hand is super nice. Rune Crab, Murphic, when Robert to start things off, Vantress Gargoyle to be there and just sit milling away until it's able to attack or block. And then Lolme just domination to steal all the things. Yeah, and we see how much Brian really uh, values all the cards in the sand. This is actually the Wind Robber that gets sent to the graveyard, allowing mm. Brian to have this clean Rune Crab into Gargoyle uh, curve. Yeah. Picking up a piece of uh, removal as well and eliminate, so that'll deal with the edge wall innkeeper at a certain point, unless the uh, poor little brushfire elemental is going to be the subject of BBD's ire. Also find his fire prophecy as Gab Nassif. Yeah, you see Gab do the easy part of the turn first. Definitely <laughs> playing Shatter Skull Smashing untapped. And then it's the question of, am I casting Fire Prophecy or am I playing the Brush Fire Elemental? And the yeah. answer for Gab was Fire Prophecy. Oh yeah, for sure. You don't want that little crab milling you out. You find the answer for it, you're going to use it. Mm. But now you're Gab's in a position... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, Gab's in a position where he can get benefit off of this Edgewall Innkeeper before the Eliminate could deal with it, so... As far as he's concerned, the Edgewall Innkeeper's done his job. Yeah, the consideration for Gab there was, can I afford to take a turn off to deal with this Vantress Gargoyle? Because if unchecked, the 5-4 Flyer is quite strong against Gruul, but uh, in order for Gab to do so, he'd have to do literally nothing on that turn to be able to double stomp it the next turn. That means essentially taking two turns off, and it's not something Gab can afford to do as the aggressor in this matchup. Yeah. It's a bit of an awkward uh, creature for the Gruul to deal with. I mean, I know they have the Soul Seer that can deal with it. But beyond that, you'd have to double spell, which is, you know, it's not something you want to be doing most of the time. No, and I don't even know if Gab brought in his copy of Soul Seer. We did see it in the sideboard, but I think in the sideboard is where it stayed, as it's a bit too costly of a removal spell to have against this rogue deck, especially when Fire Prophecy and Stomp typically answer almost all the creatures that you care about. Yeah. I mean, there is the Thrashing Brontodon, but I don't think that would have been brought in just for a Vantress Gargoyle. As, no, uh, never mind, we're just, we're just going to trade here anyway. It's fine. Ventress Gargoyle dealt with. Ooh, Clean to Dust. That Clean to Dust will do a good job of keeping Ox of Agonis and Phoenix of Ash potentially in check as mm -hmm. uh, Brian does some more milling in the turns to come, or at least uh, he hopes to be doing some more milling as there isn't currently anything to do that uh, in his hand. And really just stumbling a little on mana is hurting yeah. Brian here as there's so much more he wants to be doing. Yeah, I'd love to double spell here, deal with two threats in the battlefield at once, but unfortunately that's not the case for BBD. Needs to find a fourth land. 
soon as possible. Ideally, a blue source as well, as he's looking at that mm. into the story and Lalmage's domination in hand, and uh, a single blue source in play means he's quite a ways away from doing some of the more powerful effects that this rogue set has access to. Yeah. So goes for the eliminate on the on the love struck beast, just uh, making sure that there's not going to be any surprise lethal out of nowhere, courtesy of an amber cleave. You and I know that the amber cleave is out of the uh, main deck configuration, went to the sideboard along with the Great Henge. So, no believing in the cleave in this turn, in this game, unfortunately. Yeah, I do think there is a copy of the Great Henge left in the deck. I Maybe two, but I'm pretty sure only one. So, still mm -hmm. a consideration in terms of when to use the removal spell for Brian. Uh, but... Yeah, ultimately, just getting the Lovestruck piece off the board so he doesn't have to worry about it is the most comfortable line of play. Yeah. More removal spells. Oh my goodness, where is this fourth land? It's probably what Brian is thinking right now. Yeah, at this point, it's getting very dicey for Brian. And mm. with each turn that he doesn't draw that third land, that fourth land, uh, his odds of winning this game go down significantly as uh, there's just no guarantee of having the time or the life total once you draw that land to do these effects that you need to be playing. Yeah. And I like the uh, the stops that he's putting on uh, Gavin Asif's turn. He doesn't have the Thieves' Guild Enforcer, but uh, just disincentivizing an attack here from Gavin yeah, Steve, just gotta, protecting that life total. Yeah, for Brian, you have to use the software uh, to your advantage, right? These mm -hmm. are some things that you can do in Paper Magic, which is just take a moment to pause when your opponent says combat or uh, whatever. You can take those moments to over-represent or uh, try to bluff something. Uh, mm -hmm. In online, that's harder to do that, and using stops uh, to represent uh, priority is one of the few ways you can to at least try to bluff something. Yeah. I think the uh, software may have betrayed Brian there, as there may have been a stop during combat, because the Thieves Guild and Force would enter Mill 2, the graveyards at 6. So we would have been able to block the brush fire elemental. So maybe giving giving away his secrets there a little bit. But nevertheless, we found land number four. And we can start doing multiple things per turn. Yay! Start by getting rid of the scavenging ooze before oh, yes. it really just ruins all of our plans. <laughs> before it starts multiplying. No, it doesn't multiply. It just, you know, disrupts the rogue game plan. Yeah, but Brian is at seven. And this brush fire elemental with that evolving wands in hand <laughs> oh, yeah. is representing lethal. So step one for Brian, get rid of the use. Step two, get rid of the elemental. Step mm -hmm. three, hope Survive. ox breaks. <laughs> the, <laughs> things are looking really tough for Brian right now. Yeah, a little unfortunate stumbling on lands there, but uh, that's, that's what happens sometimes. So scavenging ooze, dealing with that cling to dust, recognizing that that could be a way for Brian to claw back into this. Evolving wilds, here we go. Let's go brush fire elemental. It's going to get answered by the drown in the lock. But uh, still things are looking pretty good here for Gabna Steve. Yeah, and this is a position where I, I think as Brian, you should be allowing Nasif to go to combat first. Mm -hmm. uh, considering Drown the Lock is uh, converted mana cost, not power, it doesn't really matter how big the Brushfire Elemental gets. So uh, I guess perhaps from Brian's point of view, he's playing around the Great Henge. He doesn't want it to get too large as he doesn't want to give Nasif the ability to play that Great Henge. But mm -hmm. again, Gab boarded out most copies and this information now allows Gab to freely make an attack that he may otherwise hesitate because of a card like Soaring Thought Thief. Yeah. Soaring Thought Thief is the draw off the top. It could jump in the way of one of these creatures, but looks like we're going to go to Lurus of the Dream Den and get out one of our blockers in the Ruined Crab to just keep us alive. We'll keep Brian alive for one extra turn. 
Yeah, and one extra turn is all he gets here is uh, he has nothing left but a chump on Osivagonis mm-hmm. and it loses to most things because Xander Mammoth is not one of them. <laughs> Kevin Steve was just chucking everything out and I was just like, Wee! look at all my cards. Look at all the things I can do. Almost rubbing it in, unfortunately, for Brian, who's uh, literally clinging to life, has clinged to dust, has drawn off the top, and recognizes this is a losing game and scoops them on up. All right. So we're going to go to a very quick commercial break as the players sideboard for game number three. But don't go anywhere because there's plenty more magic to come after this. We're back here at MTG League Weekend. Everybody, welcome. It's Gabna Steve versus Brian Brown doing We Are Sideboarding. Gabna Steve just stepped away from his computer for a brief moment. But uh, as soon as he's back, we'll jump into the action here and determine who is going to be our winner between Gruul, Adventures, and Demir Rogues. Any thoughts so far, Marnie? Is the game going how you expected it to? Or any any surprises or curveballs being thrown at these players? Game two was a lot more uh, like I expected, and it makes sense considering it is the post-board games. Gab gets to trim all of the cards that are kind of mediocre in the matchup, and here in game three, we actually see because Gab is on the play, he's boarded out the third copy of the Great Henge as well. This is all about just aggression and having access to these escape cards as... uh, ways to cover your mid and late game uh the scorching dragon fire in the deck uh but the copy of soul seer remaining in the sideboard nothing too unexpected here from gab nasif and yeah it just looks like gab is trying to win this game by taking advantage of the cards that uh brian is putting in his graveyard it's just a few minor tweaks with 30 seconds left using it all the time available to gab as, as yellow hat does. <laughs> <laughs> as Brian waits patiently. I wanted to ask you about the brush fire elementals. Quite a few people have asked me to like play versus draw. Do they always come out at a certain point? Do they always stay in at a certain point? Or is it just matchup dependent? I think it's matchup dependent. It the big selling point for Brushfire Elemental, other than the fact that it grows, is that it has pseudo unblockability against smaller creatures. So in matchups where you expect it to be blockable a lot of the time, uh, the value is not really there as much. And I think that's something that we see why it gets prioritized so highly in matchups like Rogues and Esper Yorian, where it can't really get blocked by most of the cards in the deck. Skyclave Apparition doesn't block it. Omen of the Sun uh, tokens don't block it. The uh, Bertha Miletus tokens don't block it. So it's one of those cards where it, the more likely it is to be unblockable, the higher its value goes, and that's why we see a lot of people board out most copies in the Gruul Mirror. All right. That first opening hand that we saw for BBD was a big yikes. Five lands, two spells, and all of them were tapped. It's like... Mm. Let's not go with that one. This hand, though, looks to be a lot more favorable. I'm going to send back a copy of Blood Chief's Thirst and get things underway here with a Temple of Deceit that finds a Fable Passage on top of the library. So 
bit of a clunky start in terms of the lands, but uh, certainly better than that first hand. Yeah, Bruin Crab into double fetch line, you can't really be unhappy about it, even though with a hand that contains Double Thieves Guild Enforcer, you would much rather the ability to play one on turn one. Uh, mm -hmm. But as it stands, the straw's really explosive, and it has the potential to be really good. Well, let's see if our Mulligan hand serves Ryan Braun doing well as we get things underway here for Gab Nassif as well. Try to skull pass as the land. And now the option to either go Edgewall Innkeeper Ooze or kill a crab. Would you would you would you like to kill a crab, Gab? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's tempting, right? You really don't want to let the ruined clap crab live for too long, but mm -hmm. considering the fabled passage has already come out, Gab might feel like the damage is done, and now maybe because uh, of his current position, he might want to get a bit more aggressive with that brush fire elemental. Which is exactly what he does. A <laughs> second rune crab. Levy. Hello. So that's not uh, that's not going to be a good sight for Gab Nassif. That's a lot of mill. <laughs> it's a lot of mill. That's a crab. That's Fable Passage, whatever land it fetches, and a Thieves Guild Enforcer, or a brush, or a uh, excuse me, a Blood Chief's Thirst to kill the Brush Fire Elemental. Yeah, I think that may be part of what BBD is considering, but with those these skilled enforcers, you can just block the Brushfire Elemental. It, I, I would much rather be holding Blood Chief's Thirst for something like a Scavenging Ooze. It is a mm -hmm. much more problematic creature for you uh, in this current matchup. So opting to not use the Rune Crab, going to keep up both copies of the Thieves' Guild Enforcer to get double mill going. That Apologies, is... we've jumped into a different table now. Our cameraman has gotten very excited and run over to the other feature match area. Ruh -ruh. <laughs> We're seeing uh, PVDDR versus Marcio Carvalho, I believe. So we'll just get <laughs> back to uh, we'll get back to our other game momentarily, friends. Just it, it, bear with some us. Some spoilers for the next round. It might be. Uh oh. Sorry for the technical difficulties, folks. We will try to get this fixed as soon as possible. <laughs> Ailey, I'm not even going to try to commentate this game in no. progress. I'm sorry. <laughs> We'll just pretend it's, it's n nothing's happening here, but uh, slight technical oopsie here. We apologize, friends. Uh, we'll get to this match a little later on today. We'll see exactly what we're on. Just trying to get hold of our producer to uh, get us back to the game that we're on. So, Money, the matchup that we were watching uh, in Brian Brown doing versus Gab Nassif, where we left things off, who would you say was uh, looking looking to be the victor in that matchup, or who had the advantage? Uh, at that exact moment, it was still in BBD's favor. The big problem for BBD was Gab had a really good hand that contained multiple pieces of removal to deal with the Thieves' Guild Enforcers and... Uh, threats that Brian was going to be presenting while Brian had no copies of Into the Story in hand. So the refill that Brian needed to follow up that turn didn't, that hand didn't really exist. So whenever we get back to it, I think the big question posed for BD is can you find some card advantage? Mm -hmm. So just a second for us, friends. Yeah, Again, sorry, apologies folks. for this. All right, no worries. Just a few technical difficulties. Welcome Things back. freezing all of a sudden. We'll just uh, we'll blame Windows for that one, friends. So we're going to get the game queued up. So don't stress. Money, let's uh, let's tell some jokes to our lovely audience. Two drums and a cymbal fall off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
we were at the about the mid game of game three. Third turn of game three ish. Yeah, roughly. Yeah, we're trying to get this back. All right, here we go. Let's finish off this game. There we go. Blood Chief's Thirst taking care of that brush fire elemental. There's an Ox of Agonis down on the battlefield. Both rune crabs now there and milling away happily as little milly crabs do. Yeah, we we are a bit further ahead than where we were, but really what happened is pretty clear. Uh, Brian milled an Ox of Agonis uh, and that allowed Gab to use one of the fire prophecies, remove the first Thieves Guild Enforcer, escape that Ox of Agonis, and get a brand new hand while making use of the cards that Brian had already milled into his graveyard. So now this is the exact scenario that I was worried about where Brian is sitting there with just the Loris left and mm. Gap has access to the Ox in his graveyard, the Phoenix in his graveyard, as well as the full new hand that this Ox escape gave him. Yeah, that Ox has been MVP in a lot of gruel lists. Just being able to get card advantage, a threat on the battlefield, and basically say to any mill plans, like, I don't care, mill me. I'm cheaper when I when you do. As now we're going to see the uh, Heart's Desire token created from the Lovestruck Beast. And a Phoenix of Ash flies once more, getting rid of some of those cards in the graveyard. Yeah, in case this matchup with the removal that Gruul has access to wasn't favored enough, for Gruul. Uh, the addition of escape creatures makes it so life is just so difficult uh, to ever really keep up with because especially this inclusion of Ox of Agonis means that not only does Gap have a creature to bring back from the graveyard in the face of these rogues, but he's also refilling his hand and continuing to put on pressure. Pressure which doesn't come in the form of a rune crab for BBD. No land to uh, benefit off of that either. There's 16 cards left in the deck. So if we do rip a Fabled Passage off the top, that would be game. That would be game. I believe two Fabled Passages already used for Brian, so only has access to one more. But mm -hmm. I wonder if this is a consideration in uh, Gab's mind when looking at his hand and figuring out what to do. Unfortunately doesn't really have much of a choice. Uh, does have to remove this Loris, otherwise it's going to be able to return a Ruin Crab anyways, but maybe this will allow him to attack first and push through some extra damage because Gab won't be able to block with a Ruin Crab without risking losing it to Shatter Skull Smashing. Yeah. Or block with the Loris, actually, for that matter, because it's the exact same outcome. <laughs> the Loris does gain the life, though, and uh, maybe... Brian needs to hold out for that just to try and find a way to. Oh, my goodness. This is this is it, tense. <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound, right? Hmm. Brian's like, OK, if I'm blocking with Loris, Shatter Skull Smashing is going to kill two creatures anyways. So I'm just going to block extra and hope that I play around an Ember Cleave or something. And it yeah. makes no difference. Doesn't make a difference now. Oh, boy. So tense times here for BBD as Gab Nassif is just piling on the pressure. This uh, Phoenix of Ash can actually, the Phoenix of Ash can pump itself up twice here as well. It can, uh, but that would involve letting the mm -hmm. Lord survive. That's not something that, Brian, uh, that Gab is in the market of doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at this point, Gab is happy to lose his Edgewell Innkeeper, play Shatter Soul Smashing, remove Luris and one of these crabs, and that'll close to guarantee that there's no uh, mill victory coming for Brian at least yeah. next turn. Certainly if Brian was to top deck a into the story here, depending on what Gab's graveyard size is, as I am not sure currently, that could be the beginning of a comeback in to this game, potentially string some land drops together, win with these crabs, but Temple of Deceit not going to do mm. it. 16 cards left. 10 cards left now. And a Merfolk Wind Rubber on the top. That'll that that'll get in the way. That'll get in the way of the Phoenix of Ash. Oh man. To see Brian's just like, where is my into the story? Where is my card draw? Getting in the way is a start, though, because if 
Brian is under the assumption that Gap has boarded out his uh, Ember Cleaves. A chump blocker mm -hmm. and drawing an extra card may do the same thing here while allowing Brian the opportunity to potentially find the extra pieces of mill that he needs. So uh, maybe even just being able to play the Merfolk Wind Robber, block, sacrifice, find mm -hmm. him into the story is the line that can potentially win Brian this game. Looks like Brian thinks that that is not the way to go. So Merfolk Wind Robert to the bottom of the library. Fire Prophecy. This can kill one of the crabs. Yeah, with each piece of removal that comes out from Gab on these crabs, any small single digit percentage uh, that Brian had mm. hopes of winning uh, dwindle further, right? It's just there's not much hope left uh, as these removal spells come out to remove these crabs that are the only thing really holding this together. Yeah. So we're going to see the Fire Prophecy take care of one of the crabs, send back the Fabled Passage. <sighs> Do we want to draw a card, though? That is the question Gab is asking himself. Well, Fire Prophecy, Prophecy is card parody. The big question is... Uh, considering you're going to discard whatever card you draw anyways, if you're just going to play an ox here, which you may not even want to play mm -hmm. an ox here, uh, is, is it worth it? Gab says, no to the Fabled Passage going back. Does he go for the Ox of Agonis, though? I highly doubt it. At this yeah. point, Gab is playing it far too safe. This is likely just a Phoenix of Ash pump and set mm -hmm. up the two-turn lethal and hope Brian doesn't draw out of it because Osvigonis is just digging three cards deeper and I don't think that's something Gab wants to do in this position. Mm -mm. Doesn't want to put himself at risk of losing to Mill once again like he did in the first game. He actually doesn't have to pump the Phoenix of Ash. He could just play the Love Strike Beast instead because a double pump next turn is still lethal. Mm -hmm. uh, so for Gab, just has to weigh the benefits and costs here. But having a second potentially lethal attacker in case he draws a removal spell is pretty valuable in this spot. So just the three points of damage followed up by the Love Struck Beast passes the turn back. And a land off the top is not what's going to get Brian out of this. It'll mill three more cards. But Gab must keep has enough. Left. Brian has yeah. to keep that as a block. Yeah. Oh, there it is. There's the bluff. Oh, man. <laughs> Playing mind games here with Gab Nassif. <laughs> not the best person might, to play my games again. No, not at all. He might he might be thinking, oh, if I could just stall for eight minutes, maybe I can win. Uh, at this <laughs> point, that's looking like the only way out here for BBD. Phoenix of Ash, there's another way to uh, chip some extra damage in. But uh, like you said, the double pump will just get the job done here. Yeah, Gap going to diversify his bird resources here by playing the other <laughs> Phoenix rather than a pump. Uh, and yeah, same result because three mana to give plus two plus zero, three mana to play two two. Uh, they all roads lead to victory here for Gabna Seif, as all mm -hmm. he has to do is attack all and pump either Phoenix for the victory. So you need to send the one one in as well. Uh, no, no. real reason not no, to, fine. but <laughs> doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at this point. Lethal on board for Gab Nassif. An unfortunate turn of events for Brian Brown Dew. And there we go. Everyone's swinging in. That's what we like to see. Gab Nassif is going to pick up the victory here in round 11 of the MTG League weekend. Go, go, Gruel. He's just doing one more check. He's like, just let me make sure. Just let me make triple sure that there Welcome is absolutely the nothing. <laughs> there it is. There we go. That's going to do it. Gabna Seif picking up the victory with Gruel Adventures. Once again, proving to be a pretty dominant force in the standard meta right now. Mani, any yeah. final thoughts on that matchup? I, I, I mean, that's 
how we expect the matchup to go, right? Brian was able to steal game one, uh, partially because of Gab's draws, partially because he he drew the two copies of Lal Mage's Domination. He only has two in the main deck. He drew both of them, and it was enough to cobble together bit together a victory against Gab, but typically, especially post-board when all the escape creatures come in, it, the Gruul deck does what it does even more consistently than usual, and, and that's pretty amazing for a deck that is designed to be as consistent as possible. So, it, no real surprise at the end, but for BBD fans, it just sucks to see them go down this way. It does, but uh, that's just how it goes sometimes. But friends, we'll be back with more magic after this, so don't go anywhere. Hey everybody, welcome back to MTG League Weekend Play as we watch the MPL battle it out in these matches for their MPL life by the time the end of the season rolls around. Let's take a look at our feature match for this round. We've got another one for you here coming from round number 11. Andrew Cuneo versus Shahar Shenhar. Seven wins locked up for Cuneo so far in these couple of tournaments. Nine for Shahar Shenhar, the world champ. Is it control for Andrew Cuneo? Gruel Adventures for Shahar Shenhar. So Andrew Cuneo, we saw his deck in action a little bit uh, earlier in the show, and it is a... It's a spicy brew. Midnight clock. Hello. All right. Let's go down to the future match area and see if we can't see that thing go off. <laughs> Thank you so much, Maria. Let's jump on in here. Andrew Cunha and Shahar Shenhar both up a game. We saw this deck in action earlier, Mani. I don't know if you saw much of it, but oh my goodness me. Midnight clock is ridiculous. Yeah, I was just laughing at that statistics screen we have in the face head-to-head -head between the mm -hmm. two players as, shockingly, there's no uh, data available <laughs> for Shahar's win percentage from week one against Is It Control. It, really bizarre as Is It Control is such a powerhouse of this current standard metagame. Well, hey, I mean, Kudio's making it work for him, all right? Whatever floats his boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that win against Lishi Tian was awesome yeah that was an absolutely absurd game of magic to watch <laughs> i just love listening to marshall and uh, eduardo laughing themselves laughing themselves silly about it but uh let's focus on the game ahead here as it is gruel adventures versus is it control a list that we are not very familiar with in the current standard metagame but uh it's playing some of the regular faces that you'd expect to see in a blue Red deck in Bone Crusher Giants, Shark Typhoon, Shadow Skull Smashing. But one thing we're not used to seeing is Kiora <laughs> Best, the Sea God. I was really hoping that you would just rattle it off as one of the cards we're used to seeing. We're you so know, used Shadow to Skull seeing Smashing, this Kiora ridiculous Best, card. Standard <laughs> staples. Not a staple by any means, but uh, certainly very powerful if it goes unchecked. And also, it's, yeah, it's a risky card to bring in, isn't it? It, it is. It's a seven mana card against the deck that's really trying to kill you. Uh, and there are two copies in Kunio 75, one in the main deck, one in the sideboard. Uh, and because this is game three, the fact that it's still here means that Kunio is a fan of it in the matchup. He thinks that it's actually going to do some work here for him. 
Well, let's see if that is indeed the case. As Great Henge now makes its way onto the battlefield, courtesy of the Bone Crusher Giants, deduction in cost could fire off the scavenging ooze. It won't be able to munch on any graveyard, but it will get a counter on it and make sure that the Bone Crusher Giant that is in Kunio's hand won't be able to stomp it down. Well, I believe the counter is actually a trigger. Oh, it is so a trigger. With yes, no you're correct. In the graveyard, Kunio would be able to respond, which is why I think we actually see Shahar taking some pause here and not just immediately playing the ooze, as perhaps he is worried about a second copy of Stomp coming out from Kunio in response to that trigger mm -hmm. from the Great Henge. You are indeed correct. As Shark Typhoon is cycled away, making an itty bitty baby shark for Andrew Kunio just to start chipping away in the sky. Ooh, hello, Storm's Wrath. Things get out of hand. That's a card that I, I'm kind of surprised to not see as maybe just a one of fun of for some of the Gruul decks. Yeah, sure, you don't want to kill your own creatures, but uh, we've seen these battlefields get out of hand. Do you think there's any consideration to have it in the Gruul decks or not really? It it's tough because a lot of times the only creature on your side of the board that is living through Storm's Wrath is Lovestruck Beast. But mm -hmm. if you're wiping all of your 1-1s one while playing it uh, to have your Lovestruck Beast survive, it's almost like you've killed your Lovestruck Beast as well. And because <laughs> Gruul uh, so heavily relies on having its board for its cards like Embercleave, mm -hmm. uh, just... It, it can't really afford to do a full board wipe, even in yeah. matchups where it could potentially benefit it. You'll kill your love-struck beast of a broken heart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Clothus has become a creature. I wonder if that Lull Mage's domination would like to yoink it over on this side of Andrew Cunio. I do not think Andrew would mind. Mm -mm. It's like, oh, you're beaming me in the head? Well, how would you like it if I took your card? And start doing that to you. But I also don't know if Andrew has the time, honestly, mm -hmm. because this is an ember cleaved god uh, coming through <laughs> here. And it, it, for Andrew to steal this Clothis, it would take all of his mana and he mm -hmm. would be taking a tapped creature that will no longer be a creature. He's about to take a ton of damage here. And I, I think for Andrew, he's almost forced to play that B Storm's Wrath next turn. Wouldn't be a bad idea indeed, as that would also shut off the clothus. Oof. Or yeah, you see the, life. the shake of the head from Andrew there. And that's because he realizes that he's almost in checkmate here. Because if he uses Storm's Wrath, he clears off the board, but Clothus remains alive, and now there's fodder for it. So he's mm. going to die in two turns to Clothus, and he will no longer be able to Lull Mage's Domination it, because there won't be enough devotion to keep it as a creature. If he plays Lull Mage's Domination, then he's just going to die to the board available along yeah. with that Embercleave. So... There's no real good options left for Andrew from here. Yeah, and this is going to be very telling for Shahar Shenhar, knowing that there's a Storm's Wrath in the deck of Andrew Cunio, as here it comes, wiping the entire battlefield. And as you said, Clothus now going to get munching on the graveyard, putting Andrew Cunio on a two-turn clock. Yeah, and Shahar makes sure to not exile a creature, wanting there to be plenty of targets for the scavenging ooze. And now with green mana untapped, if oh. Andrew was to Bone Crusher Giant, he would just be able to eat a creature. Yeah, I mean, that's lethal right there. Cloth is jumping back into the battlefield. The devotion to green and red.